दूर रहते हैं हाय, आम हेलो Sorry to stop your shopping and end your evening. Hello. Uh, I just have a very special message for a very special girl. This is where we met three months ago. Oh my God, there are people looking. <laughs> this is where we first saw each other and this is where I fell in love with you. So cute. And, and you're my absolute John. And you had me that day at hello when you said hello to me. I mean, after I said hello, anyway, you're my John, you're my sweetie pie, you're my cutie pie, you're my absolute Oops. John. And Um, anyway, keep going. Um, uh, you, Janu, you're my sweetie pie, you're my cutie pie, you're my shono, you're my everything. And, and and I know you find this cheesy, but but I want everyone to know you make me really happy. And I have a little poem for you, and I, I'd like everyone to hear this. When you smile, the whole world stops and stares for a while, and my heart ceases to beat, and there's nothing else that I seek except you. And I just have one question for you. No, 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 I need to, no, please, I need to, I need to. You truly make me the happiest person on earth. Are you okay? I really thought it was sweet. You're expecting, right? Well, imagine yourself in this guy's shoes, right? He's found a girl, the girl, right? Or at least he thought he was she was the girl. And as we talked about last week, he was longing for this exclusive, intimate relationship with her, where he could really share his heart openly, and 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 that kind of relationship can only be found in, in, in one where the significant other returns that kind of love and somehow he's misread the signs right maybe he's uh, a little ahead of the pace I don't know there's a number of things that could have happened there but the safe place that she he thought he had for his heart just wasn't there and he's left stunned on the floor in front of all of these tons of people, embarrassed, right? What just happened? A couple of questions to ponder here. Do you think this guy would think twice before he went to that step again? Would you? I mean, <laughs> there's obviously some pain, there's some wounds maybe in his heart, and uh, some healing that would have to take place for him to actually jump right back into that. Um, and the truth is, there's lots of ways to damage our hearts, isn't there? There's just a lot of different ways, and many of us have experienced hurt hearts. And maybe not quite as impressive as him, but um, our hearts can get hurt. Can you think of a time when you had your heart damaged, your heart hurt? One story that I was thinking about that's kind of a, a silly one was when I was in fourth grade, I actually liked this girl, and... And it was really the first girl I'd ever noticed. Before, I think I thought all of them had cooties. And, and I don't know that I'd ever experienced this feeling before. And I didn't tell anyone, not even my best buds, especially my best buds. But um, eventually, I was just kind of anguishing over this agony, trying to figure out what to do. And so I take the risk, right? And I write her a note. And I spent some time on this note, decorated it up all nice and pretty and beautiful. And, and then I mailed it to her not email, right? We didn't have email. I snail mailed it, as we call it now, and, and uh, you know, nothing seemed to change. Nothing. I mean, she was in my class in fourth grade. I saw her every day, and she didn't even let on that anything had happened. And so I'm going through all this thought process in my head, wondering, uh, thinking about all the different things that could have went wrong, right? Bad things. I had kind of put my heart out there and taken this risk and then one day, a couple weeks later, you know, I'm kind of just wandering through class, and she had had her desk open. You know, they had lids on. I don't know if they still have lids on desks anymore or not, but um, 
And there in the desk was my note. So this note that I had risked my heart with, right? I'd taken a lot of risk. I mean, what if my buds would have found out about this? They would have killed me, right? She's sharing this with the whole world, at least a couple of her girlfriends, right? I mean, it was agonizing. Well, the fact that I, that I still remember this today means a lot, doesn't it? I can't even remember what happened last week. And, and I can remember this, right? There was just something that was so personal to me that, you know, that risk that I took. It's just, um, you know, would I go about the same way, you know, in fourth, the end of fourth grade or fifth grade or sixth grade and do the same thing with another girl? No, I wouldn't. I'd learned my lesson, right? I'm not going to do that again. Um, of course, I did eventually recover. That's why I throw that in there. But, um, And really, that doesn't even compare to what this guy went through or maybe even what you've been through. I mean, there's just points in life where we just get our hearts hurt, right? And it's painful. How do we ever recover from this? Well, last week we started a series focusing on what a follower of Jesus should look, look like post-Easter, right? The post-Easter story. What should be our driving force? What should be our soul activity? And we spent some time comparing the relationship with Jesus with, with a marriage, right? We had some fun with that. We, we talked about Dalton and Jillian and, and, and uh, you know, they were here last week and they're here again this week. They did go away but they're back. Um, you know, we, we talked about that celebration of the wedding that we'd experienced. And, and when we get together for that celebration, it wasn't to celebrate that they somehow knew each other fully, right? Or it doesn't even, it's not even a celebration of, of um, them even, know, even knowing what they were getting themselves into, right? They wouldn't have known that fully. They probably know some more information now. We should interview them. Um, or even that they are perfectly perfect for each other and won't ever have any problems, right? That's not what we were celebrating. None of those things. We were celebrating their covenant. We were celebrating their committing to each other, not to avoid those types of problems, but in spite of the unknown, in spite of the things that they may encounter, right? We were celebrating their covenant. And as much like our, our, that first step in our relationship with Jesus as Lord and Savior. Didn't know exactly what we were getting into. Didn't know exactly who he was even. We're still learning that, right? But yet we are still committed. We're still in covenant with him, and he's with us. And, and so we looked at the marriage vows, that covenant together, and they are so similar to what we commit to Christ. Although this relationship is just so unreasonably exclusive, right? It's also unreasonably inclusive. As we looked in Mark 12, 30, it tells us we are called to, to love Jesus with, with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, all of our strength, which really doesn't leave a lot out, right? It includes everything, much like a marriage. And the amazing thing is that much like a marriage, we enter into this relationship not out of obligation, not out of duty, not out of slavery forcing us to do it, but, but we're actually entering into this relationship with Christ joyfully, delightfully. We want to do it, right? I mean, it's, it's incredible to think about this, this covenant, this commitment that we're called to, and yet we want to do it. It's almost as if God has designed us to experience marriage so that we might somehow comprehend this kind of relationship that he wants to have with us. It's just kind of interesting to look at. You know, this relationship, this, this loving, serving, intimate, through thick and thin, um, all in, forever relationship. Well, this week we're going to add to that discussion. This morning we are going to focus on one particular that verse in Mark 12, that we are called to love the Lord your God with all of your heart. We're going to focus on the heart specifically. Are you ready for that conversation? The truth is that we struggle a lot with our hearts. Much like the guy in the video or even me in, in fourth grade, 
we tend to want to follow our heart wherever it might lead, right? Wherever and um, with whoever our heart feels like going to. We let the heart lead us at times. And we even tend to give away our hearts to people and things that, that really aren't very trustworthy. Have you noticed that? People and things that, that in all honesty were not designed to give our hearts to <laughs> in the first place. We just weren't meant to do that. And in the process, we end up in situations where our hearts get damaged, broken. And then once our hearts are damaged, then all sorts of other issues start developing in our lives. I mean, we end up at times having a lack of self-worth because we've been so damaged. We're, we end up being overcritical. We can end up being abusive or avoiding all types of intimacy. I mean, there's just a long list of things <laughs> as we're trying to hold things together with a broken heart, the things that we end up doing, right? We've all met people who represent that well. Maybe you totally understand what I'm talking about here this, this morning. In fact, I personally have found that two, uh, maybe three main responses to a broken, damaged heart. Two opposite extremes. One, on one side is the person who's trying to rebuild their their own self-worth. They're really struggling with the damage that's in their heart. And, and they have been damaged to the point where they really feel like they have to try to please everyone that they run into. They are just trying so hard to be loved. They're trying so hard to be accepted. Would someone just please love me, right? They're the ultimate people pleaser. In fact, they can end up being the ultimate God pleaser. Just living into this kind of sacrificial living on the altar of good works, um, investing themselves fully into maybe a loved one, a, a spouse, or maybe their kids, or maybe even their boss, right? They're just going to the nth degree, trying to make someone love them. They just can't get enough attention. They might even spend a lot of time building themselves up, talking themselves up, even in a way that maybe they could never hope to be. They know down deep that it's just not there. I mean, can you relate to a person like that? Do you know some people like that? It really reminds me of Jesus' conversation with the Pharisees in Matthew 23, 25 to 26. It says, Woe to you, Jesus says to the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, you, you hypocrites, you clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they're all full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside also will be clean. If you just work on the inside, if you just work on the heart, well, that's easier said than done, isn't it? I mean, we tend to pick on the Pharisees a lot, so it's kind of fun, but, but I actually totally feel for them here. <laughs> they know down deep that they are dirty. Something in their life, you know, they're, they're, they're shameful on the inside. Maybe, maybe their hearts are broken. And in all honesty, what are they supposed to do about it? Do they know what to do? They, they invest in their lives on the outside of the cup. They end up working on outward behavior in the hopes of at least feeling good about themselves in that way. I mean, how are they supposed to get the inside clean? Right? How are they supposed to work on the heart in the first place? Well, we're going to get to that. The other extreme in this broken heart scenario is the one who has built these great big walls. And they're really kind of walking fully into their worthlessness. They're, they're just broken. They're broken. They're damaged. And they don't want anyone else to know about it, right? And one way that these wall people go about it is, is to just avoid contact with all of the world, if at all possible. At least that way they won't get hurt worse, right? Some, some drown themselves in, in their alcohol or some other drug and just so they won't feel the pain. It's kind of self-medicated. Some, some live vicariously through other people. Maybe through characters in the books that they're engrossed in. Maybe through characters in their TV shows or their movies. Or, or maybe they're engrossed in their music or some hobby. They're, they're trying to cope. They're trying to figure out a way to get through this and hold things together. Another group behind the great big wall <laughs> doesn't try to avoid contact but actually embraces it. But they hide their brokenness by going to war with everyone they meet. <laughs> You've probably met this kind before. Um, they, they hide their brokenness 
by blowing other people up, right? They know they can't win, and they don't want you to win. So they're going to go out of their way to make sure everyone loses. So these people are just kind of hypercritical, overcritical. They're, they're, they're rebellious towards just about everything. Anyone you know? I mean, have you thought about these people before? Maybe you have gone through that before. And I can see the Pharisees in this approach to life, too. Can't you? They're, they're kind of overly religious while attacking everyone else's really religiousness and, and trying to push them down so they could somehow be up. They're trying to compensate by, by attacking people, right? Well, none of these approaches is going to help with the healing process. None of these approaches is actually the way we were designed to live, right? So what do we do? How do we get through those moments where we just have a broken heart? We're damaged. How do we get through this? And well, the first step is really to go back to the first, go back to the root of the matter. This is where the Bible really helps in this. The reality is that we usually get our hearts broken in the first place because we've missed God's design for us. God desires all of our hearts because He is the only one worthy <laughs> to, to, to be in that place in our life. To give someone or something else your whole heart, that, that was not the way God designed us, right? And so we end up treating that person, that thing, as a God. Or as the Bible calls it, your idol. And replacing God with something or someone else will cause you to place unrealistic expectations on that person or thing. It may even be something that God designed for you to enjoy. But you've elevated them to the value that's way higher than what a human should be in, right? And so that person, when they're placed into that spot, it just twists things, doesn't it? It twists things. And, and so the, they become almost a damage, damaging force in your life because they will always disappoint always disappoint because they're not designed to be there god's designed to be there and then again it might be a spouse it may be your kids it may be a job or a hobby or i mean it could be a lot of different things but none of these things were created to be your god none of these things should be your focus your your sole activity your driving force they will always disappoint when you when they get put in the, into that place in fact, when our hearts are firmly placed in God's hands where it should be, this allows us to be free in ways that we don't normally get to experience. We actually have an opportunity to invest in others that just isn't possible otherwise when we actually have our heart in the right place. We can actually take risks with people relationally. We can be we can take risks to be transparent. We can we can actually be ourselves. We can risk intimacy. We can even risk pain, right? Because, because our hope is not in them. Our worth, our security is found in someone else. Capital S, someone else. Jesus. And he becomes our rock so that we can encounter all sorts of rough things in life and still navigate well. The truth is that, that I believe that loving Jesus with all of your heart is not only the safest place for your heart to be, but his love will satisfy your heart in a way that no other relationship can. Jesus is who you have been searching for. Jesus is the person in your life that you've been seeking for, that fulfillment. And I believe Scripture makes this case over and over and over again. I want to just share just a little bit of one story this morning. Would you turn with me to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. There's a story in Scripture that just kind of gets right to the chase in this topic. Um, pretty familiar story for most of us. Jesus is in the middle of Samaria. And there really isn't anything wrong with Samaria except for the fact that it's inhabited by Samaritans. Go figure. And Samaritans are the hate, hated, red-headed stepchild of the Israelites. They're kind of a mixed breed that's been been mixed together with other people groups. So 
they can't possibly be good enough for God, or at least the Jews thought so. But Jesus, <laughs> Jesus is different, isn't he? He's always different. He's always stirring the pot. So what does he do? He goes to Samaria, the place where Jews aren't supposed to go on purpose. So John chapter 4, beginning with verse 4, says, Now Jesus had to go through Samaria, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was through the, from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. It's kind of fascinating if you read through the book of John. This, this, uh, the way John writes his gospel is just fascinating because in the last story we would have just looked at in John chapter 3 would have been with Nicodemus at night. And now we're in the midday with the Samaritan woman. And that's what he's, he does here. He, he had to go through Samaria, and, and, and it was to meet this Samaritan. Verse 7, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water. So Samaritan and woman. <laughs> that's two strikes against you, right, as, as a person in that culture in that time. The fact that she's coming to the well by herself in the hot part of the day tells us more tells us that she's even been rejected by her own people. Going to the well is a, is a community event for the women, and, and she's not with anyone else. So here we are. She's bankrupt in her relationships, not only with God, but with her own people. Strike three. And there's no way that Jesus would have missed this detail. Jesus is a pretty sharp tack, right? Remember, he is there on purpose. He had to go through Samaria. Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to, her, said to him, you are a Jew. I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. That's the parentheses, right? And she was completely right. Not only was he not supposed to talk to her, but remember the Jewish clean laws. If she gave him a drink... <laughs> She couldn't, he couldn't drink from her utensils anyway. This wasn't allowed. <laughs> but this is Jesus. He's different. <laughs> he treats this woman like a person. Listen to his response, verse 10. Jesus answered her, if, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. If you knew the gift of God, what is the gift of God? Maybe who is the gift of God, right? Jesus is certainly the gift of God. So we might as well just capitalize gift, right? Jesus, he's the gift. What is this living water? Well, if Jesus is speaking literally, which he rarely does, <laughs> but she would have expected him to be speaking literally, he was referring to living water, which is moving water. It's like a spring, it's like a stream, a river, moving water. The water from the well that they were visiting there would have been still water, right? Not living water. Living water in this arid, dry place in Samaria would have been very precious. It would have been highly valued. That would have been a, a, a very important part. I mean, when you go out camping, you're not looking for pools of water, right? <laughs> you're looking for moving water because it's a lot safer to drink. And so it would have been there as well. It would have been important, those, those moving water opportunities. But there just weren't any moving water. There wasn't moving water in that area of Samaria. But what is interesting is that according to rabbinic law, according to the rabbis, the only water that could be used in ritual washings to make someone who's unclean clean was what? You guessed it. Living water moving water. Verse 11, Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as did also his sons and his livestock? I mean, everyone knew that in this area of Samaria there wasn't, there wasn't any rivers. There wasn't any streams. There wasn't any living, moving water. Even Jacob had to dig a well to, to water his, his, his flocks, right? How could this Jewish outsider 
someone who probably didn't even know the train at all, how could he find water that no one else has found? There's no living water here. Are you greater than Jacob? That was her question. Isn't that a setup? I mean, I could just see Jesus starting to grin at this point in the conversation. That's exactly what he wanted her to ask. Are you greater than Jacob? <laughs> that is the right question, isn't it? <laughs> Jesus was always pushing people to ask the question, who is this, right? Even in this story, are you greater than Jacob? Verse 13, Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water, Jacob's water, will be thirsty again. But, wh but whoever drinks the water that I give them, my water will never thirst. I mean, think about that from just the physical side of things. Never thirst again. Indeed, the water I give them will, will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Is Jesus greater than Jacob? Well, his water sure is, right? <laughs> he can give water that quenches thirst forever? Jesus is really kind of taking her deep on this one, isn't he? He's, he's, not only talking, he's not talking about moving physical water. He's talking about a spiritual water that would fill her thirst within her to the point of being satisfied forever. Think about that. It's interesting that Jesus is not only, not the only one thinking, thinking in terms of water. We actually see this in the Old Testament a few different times. Isaiah uses this imagery when he calls all in Israel who are thirsty to come to the water supplied by God. Isaiah 55 says, come all who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Now, there's a great question for our culture. Listen, listen to me. Eat what is good and you will delight in the richest affair. Give ear and come to me. Listen, that you may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. We're back to the marriage covenant again, aren't we? But what a beautiful image of God's healing grace, the gift, the water for those who are thirsty, his bread that satisfies. This all comes when we receive this hope that's in God. It's another instance at the end of time when God's blessings would be flooding the land that Ezekiel in Ezekiel chapter 47 and then Zechariah and Zechariah 14, they both describe this scene where this living water is literally flowing out of the temple. It's kind of interesting. It's, that water flows into the Dead Sea. It flows into the Mediterranean Sea. And, and everywhere it goes, it brings everything to life. In fact, listen to Ezekiel 47. I thought you might like this because it talks about fruit trees. And hey, we're in Emmet, right? So catch this part. Verse 12, fruit trees of all kinds will grow on both banks of the river, the river that flows out of the out of the sanctuary, out of the, out of the temple. Their leaves will not wither, nor will their fruit fall, fail. Every month they will bear fruit. An odd fruit tree, right? Because the water from the sanctuary flows to them. Their fruit will serve for food and their leaves for healing. So we get this description of life and food, satisfying food, healing, from the waters that come from the presence of God. But the Samaritan woman misses it, doesn't she? Verse 15, the woman said to her, said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. She's interested, isn't she? She should be. I would be, right? And she wants this, this water that will remove her thirst forever. But she's still thinking about physical things, isn't she? She's thinking about maybe building a pipeline to get this moving water to, to her house, and then she wouldn't have to go to the well. I mean, I'm just kind of overthinking this a little bit. But, um, but it's still physical water, isn't it? 
But just think about it from a physical water standpoint, from her perspective, because when she goes on that walk every day out to get water in the middle of the day, what is she reminded of? That she's a failure. That she's all alone. That's what it, what <laughs> even physical water would do for her. This living water. But Jesus isn't talking about physical water, is he? He's talking about something much more important than that. Life the nourishment of her soul, healing, healing. There is a well, so to speak, in her life that she kept going to. She continually returned to, not just the physical water with the physical well, but there was a well in her life that she was just going to to try, and try to find fulfillment in her life. She was, she was searching for fulfillment, and she never could find it. You know what it was? It was her relationship with men. She tried to use men to fill the hole in her life, to find that fulfillment, to get satisfied. And and you know what? It never worked. And she was wounded. She was broken because of it. And Jesus brings her wound right out into the open. Verse 16, Jesus tells her, Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. You can just imagine what she would have been feeling at that point. Her her heart would have literally dropped. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. (laughs) Her heart would have even dropped further, right? Someone knows. He knows. Now, why would Jesus bring out this wound? Was it to condemn her, to somehow make her feel worse about herself than she already felt? Do you think that was the case? No. Jesus brings out this wound to offer her healing. You see, just like us, when we love idols, when we love people or things, when we value people and things above God, when we love them with all of our hearts in the place where God should be, it really is like running a marathon and then deciding to, to, to rehydrate by drinking a bottle of sand. <laughs> it really wouldn't be all that tasty. Now, there may be some water content in the sand. There probably is. But that's not a great way to rehydrate, right? Not very satisfying. You know, I could see a commercial about this. Um, The prophet Jeremiah actually shares the words of God about this a little bit. Jeremiah 2, verse 11, says, But my people have exchanged their glorious God for worthless idols. Be appalled at this, you heavens, and shudder with great horror, declares the Lord. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. So do you see what's happening in her life when she tries to satisfy her soul with human relationships? Do you see what happens in our life when we try to satisfy our soul with human relationships? We are forsaking the spring of living water, God himself. We are relying on broken cisterns that can't hold water. We're trying to get them to do things that they just can't do. We were designed for so much more than that. If we could just put our heart in God's hand where it belongs, our sole activity, our our most important focus, to love him with all of our heart, everything else would fall into place. Now, if you don't know the end of this story, we don't have a lot of time to finish it. The, The woman figures it out, doesn't she? She eventually figures out you know, she tries to run away. She tries to, tries to hide behind a few uh, tangents in the conversation. But Jesus draws her out. And, and she ends up finding the healing that she needs with Jesus in her life. She finds living water that will satisfy her soul forever. But what's interesting in that is, you know, as she's finding that she's no longer an outcast with God, that she's found fulfillment in him, 
she also finds out that she's now no longer an outcast with other people either. It's kind of interesting. She ends up running back to town, and she brings the whole town back to meet Jesus so they can experience this living water for themselves. So when you think about this, with Jesus holding her heart, holding her love, hoping, holding all of her dreams, all of her hopes, she is able to take risks relationally. She can risk rejection. She can love her neighbor as herself because her hope isn't in men. Her hope is in a very safe place with him, right? And, and in so doing, she offers hope to her whole village. So I want to just ask you this morning, are you needing some healing of your heart? Maybe your heart is hurt, damaged. Is there an area of your life where you are trying to find fulfillment where it just can't come? It can only be found giving your heart to Jesus. What is your well? What is it that you just keep coming back to and never fully get satisfied? What is it that someone or something that you have I mean, what is that someone or something that you have in your life that you just have a tendency to put before God? I want to ask you this morning, are you ready for some living, life-giving, soul-nourishing water that will satisfy your soul forever? Are you ready to love God with all of your heart? With all of your heart? I'll just take a few moments this morning and just be quiet and allow us to just be quiet before the Lord. Think about the different things in our life. Where are we trying to find fulfillment? Do we find it in, in Jesus? Or are there areas of our life where we truly just need to give to him? Let's just take a moment this morning with our Lord. God, I just thank you for your love for us, your plans for us, your desires for us. There isn't anyone here this morning that they knew they could satisfy their soul. You're the doer. That they could put aside the other things that have been calling so much attention in their life. Focus their attention on you. Lord God, would you just show us the way to living water? Help us to trust in you. Help us to put our hearts in your hands. To love you with all of our heart. To value you as our God, as our King. God, as you fill our lives with this living water, with your hope, with your love, help us to step out as your people, to be able to love others more fully, to be able to take risks in ways that we just couldn't do otherwise. Help us to love like you, knowing that you have our back, that you love us, that you that our self-worth is in you, that our hope, our promises are in you, that our plans are on you. Lord, would you 
question. And we just approach this relationship with you, Lord, with joy, with delight. to look at your word and, and see just how your son Jesus did it. Loving on people who need love no matter where he needed to go. We want to live like that.